Last week, we saw the rebels repulsed from our capital, a possible major change in Confederate command, and the hope of peace. This week, we see Lincoln make Davis pay for his insolence as we take revenge for every single man lost putting down the insurrection. Burn them down. After Lieutenant General Jubal Early failed to take D.C., he turned towards Virginia. Lincoln won't let him get away. The pursuit begins. The 16th, at Heenan Crossroads, there is minor skirmishing. The 19th, at Cool Springs, there is an actual battle. Morning dew floats over the ground. The 6th Corps, detached from Meade's army. The 8th Corps, Crook's detachment from the Army of West Virginia. And the 19th Corps from Louisiana begin the battle, charging over the Shenandoah River. It's a success. Colonel Joseph Thoburn leading the way. We've established a foothold, but captured rebels promise a counterattack. Thoburn is isolated, and while General Crook wants him to withdraw, General Wright won't have it. Thoburn establishes his men behind a stone wall, and the Confederates charge him. With reinforcements promised, the Union hold their small line against the tidal wave of gray. Promised men won't arrive in time. Thoburn leads an excellent defense, patching gaps wherever they form. But the sheer number of the Confederates is too much, and by the end of the day, we lost. Being forged with 22 men behind, the Confederates suffering only 400. Perhaps rebels could capitalize on this victory if they were led by a different man, but Early falls back, and this time the Union crosses in full. The 20th, at Rutherford's farm, Early's forces once again engage. This time, it's Division Commander Stephen D. Ramsher against Union Cavalier William Avril. Starts off normal, skirmishes both sides, bring up their artillery, but a small decision changes fate. We had ordered Ramsher to stick defensively. Hold to Winchester, but seeing opportunity, the Confederate infantry was ordered forward. Avril's cavalry charged forward, ready to take Winchester. Rebels quickly turn themselves in open fire, halting a regiment of infantry. But this leaves their flanks open. In a short time, they are overrun. Colonel Duval, with saber in hand, charges through the butternut brigades, killing a general, capturing many. Colonel, this is your fight. I have never seen such heroism and bravery displayed. I can brace every man in your command. It is unknown if every cavalryman received a kiss on the cheek. The rebel commander is having a much less loving view of his men. For the first time in my life, I am deeply mortified at the conduct of troops under my command. The Union suffered around 250 total. The rebels 200 killed or wounded and 250 captured. What the hell did you let the Yankees run you for this evening? The 20th, the 6th Corps, and the 19th Corps are ordered back to D.C., but strangely not to Petersburg. Grant now understands the power of the valley. He is not happy with Hunter. If only there was an aggressive commander of his he could trust. Someone like Sheridan. In 1861, hurrah, hurrah, that was when the war begun, hurrah, hurrah. In 1862, both sides were falling through. In 1863, hurrah, hurrah, old AP ended slavery, hurrah, hurrah. In 1864, old Abe called for 500,000 more, and we'll all drink stone wine when Johnny comes marching home. I should have done opera. While President Lincoln is indeed calling for 500,000 more, he also waves Olive Branch. Horace Greeley wrote to him of a Confederate peace delegation by Niagara Falls, Canada. While doubtful of the entire ordeal, he sent his personal secretary, John Hay, with Greeley to negotiate terms. Lincoln demands the restoration of the Union and the abolition of slavery. On the 18th, the two sides meet, and the men of Davis demand complete independence. There can be no peace. Wow, a short week. Oh, how could I forget? Sickles! He pens a letter to President Lincoln suggesting fellow political insider Thorpe be given a job as the Constitutional Convention in Louisiana is about to end in a success. And that's where the week... I'm forgetting something. Georgia! I wish to hear from you as to present situation and your plan of operations so specifically as will enable me to anticipate events. The next day, Davis again sends a message to Johnston. As you fail to arrest the advance of the enemy to the vicinity of Atlanta, far in the interior of Georgia, and express no confidence that you can defeat or repel him, you are hereby relieved from the command of the Army and the Department of Tennessee, which you will immediately turn over to General Hood. Much to my surprise, I received the appointment. Really, Hood? You wrote multiple letters complaining to Davis. I don't think you're surprised at all. Like that, Johnston is out and Hood takes over, receiving a temporary promotion to full general. I would also like to take a moment to give a minor correction. I forgot to mention that General Hardy, who up till now outranks Hood, was also likely passed over because he rejected command months ago. And while he will go on to say he would like to have been offered it this time around, Davis didn't know that. Which is funny. And also, how does the commander of the second most important army not get a throw check so this doesn't happen? 
Dean warns of disappointment, and Sherman, wishing to understand his opponent, meets with his three generals. Luckily, McPherson and Schofield were classmates of John Bell, and Thomas taught him. Schofield, who knows him best, explains Hood is brash, reckless, overly aggressive. Sherman likes what he hears. The Confederate government rendered us most valuable service. You might think this is a lot before even battling Hood, but this is from his memoirs, so Sherman has hindsight. Hindsight of what exactly? The Battle of Atlanta. As I'm about to start really laying into Hood, I think I should point out, he also wrote to Davis and told him now is not the time to switch commanders. But Davis responds, it is. Hood now has to hold or beat Sherman. He desperately wants to go on the offensive, looking for any weakness, and he thinks he's found it. Sherman's crossing north of Atlanta. While the Army of the Cumberland is going directly towards the city, Schofield and McPherson are being sent east to break the supply lines up to Cutter, leaving a gap. Now, Hood wants to use a fraction of his force to hold reinforcements at bay and launch a full strike on Thomas, forcing a federal withdrawal or the destruction of a full army. This plan sounds a lot like Chancellor's film. I question its sanity because it's a great gamble. There's the numerical disparity and the huge changing Confederate command. Hood is now in charge, Post Corps now led by General Stewart, and his corps by General Cheatham. Now again, to be fair to Hood, he is inheriting this plan somewhat from Johnston. But he is still the commander. The buck stops with him. My object was to crush Thomas's army before he could fortify himself, and then turn upon Schofield and McPherson. The plan requires speed and surprise, and it immediately loses the speed. Hood has to shift his line during the battle, and this gives time for Thomas to begin entrenching. The only saving grace for Hood is that, in an effort to link up the entire Union line, Thomas's left flank has been spread thin. Really, only a single division under General John Newton holds it. They came surging on through the woods, down the gentle slope, with noise and fury, like Stonewall Jackson's men at Chancellorsville. The first rebel division to attack finds itself in a gap. Instead of exploiting this and turning a flank, it soon becomes the center point of artillery fire, and is broken without ever seeing the enemy. The following assaults do better, catching us mid entrenchment, but are also repulsed. Hardy's men are shot to pieces. This leaves the battle to Stewart's Corps which carry the skirmish line, but are again repulsed. The real success is overrunning of the 33rd New Jersey, taking a small hill. As the battle continues, some of Stewart's assaults do make their way to Thomas's rear. But the bravery of General Gary rallies the retreating regiments and with battery fire, stops the succession. Hardy, hoping for victory, tries to order his reserve division of the excellent General Patrick Claiborne. Hood calls this off. Armies of McPherson and Schofield present too great a threat. Claiborne is needed elsewhere. Peachy Creek is a failure, but to continue it would be a disaster. Both sides engaged a little over 20,000 men, Union suffered around 1,750 casualties, Hood 2,500. First of all, for the rebels, the Union is at Atlanta. The city of Georgia, the hub of the rebel heartland, is within striking distance. The rebel blame game begins. Hood points the finger at Johnson Hardy. They point it right back. The Federal command has returned immediately to infighting. I only kid, they never left. Making cohesion something that could only be dreamed of. The aftermath of the defeat sees Hood try to threaten Sherman's supply line and force a battle on favorable terms. This fails. General McPherson seizes Bald Hill, a mere mile from Atlanta. When General Leggett brings his battery in position, Atlanta can be shelled. Hood downplays the loss of Bald Hill in his report, as he is one to do, proving the failure of Peachtree Creek to be a minor affair. But he knows he needs to reclaim it. If he can't, Atlanta must be forfeited. The position in demonstration of McPherson's army on the right, threatening my communications, made it necessary to abandon Atlanta or check his movements. Unwilling to fall back, he seeks another Chancellorsville, again seeing the left flank weakened. He wants Hardy to complete a nighttime march, so on the 22nd, he will be able to strike from the south. Generals Cheatham and Stewart will force a general assault. The cavalry of Wheeler will threaten the supply line. Hood is risking everything. But if he succeeds, then Atlanta will be safe. Timing is everything, and it is lost. Hardy's corps is delayed, and when it is ready to advance north, it's already dawn, six hours behind schedule. When his supporters ask for altercations to the plan, Hardy explodes. This movement has been delayed too long already. Go and obey my orders. General Walker, who had begged for altercation, suffers for Hardy's anger. When his men exit the pines, a federal picket spots the commander, and one musket ball later, Walker is dead. A single shot does an even greater service, alerting General Dodge, leader of the 16th Corps, to the rebel advance. Dodge was rushing towards Atlanta, possibly leaving Hardy in his rear. Now he turns to face the rebel threat. Just in time as Walker's division, now led by General Mercer and Bates' division, strike hard. 
but under intense rifle fire, are repulsed. Moving further west, the divisions of General Manny and Clayburn see success overrunning the front lines, forcing General Blair and his corps to hold on to the Bald Hill Line. The rebels are in a terrible spot. They have failed in their lightning strikes. They've lost a division commander. They need a victory. Sherman's headquarters. General William Tecumseh is talking with his favorite subordinate, General James B. McPherson. McPherson is loved by everyone, intensely. Both were overseeing reports of rebel evacuation. Sherman believing the city abandoned, but the sounds of battle quickly dissuade that notion. Beautifully, McPherson rides. He sees the battle. He orders his staff officers to go to Blair and Dodge. He rides towards Bald Hill, the focal point of battle. 1400 hours, he is riding down the supply line, when suddenly McPherson finds himself face to face with Claiborne's division. 1401. I threw up my sword as a signal for him to surrender. He checked his horse, raised his hat in salute, wheeled to the right, and dashed off to the rear in a gallop. Corporal Coleman, standing next to me, was ordered to fire. 1402. A staff officer rides away, striking his pocket watch against the tree. It reads 2.02 p.m. Pearson died. The rebel captain who gave the order asked who it was they shot. Sir, it is General McPherson. You have killed the best man in our army. Sherman, when he hears the news, weeps, but that was no time for mourning. He gives command of the army to Major General Black Jack Logan. The loss of McPherson instead of scaring the army puts the burning desire for revenge in every single man's heart. Nobly did they do their work that day, and terrible was the slaughter done our enemy, though at a sad cost to ourselves. Hood, examining the battle from Oakdale Cemetery, sees it. It was eyes really believed, and Hardy had failed to strike the enemy's rear, instead the front. This is no Chancellorsville, it is a Gettysburg. Treat them as order to go forward and strike head-on, aided by the Georgia militia. Bald Hill must be taken. The ferocity of the Confederates do them well, overtaking a battery and forcing a retreat. Where General Charles Wood sees this and directs his artillery to open fire on the captured battery, sure the rebels can't haul away their prize. Then with all the strength of the Union guiding them, his brigade counterattacks, reclaims the battery, and with musket and cannon shot, wreck havoc among the traitors. Truman hears first of the loss before Wood's gallantry, but fear doesn't take hold of him. City so orders General Schofield to bring his cannons to bear and to counter assault. Twenty guns fire over the heads of our men, with sword and bayonet, or the men of Hood broken. Bold's Hill is renamed Leggett's Hill. It's a complete victory for Sherman. Those losses create numbering 3,500, including McPherson. Hood suffered 5,000. Though Hood reports it is a victory, he missed himself. It's a terrible loss. He has lost a huge portion of his already outnumbered force. He is pinned in Atlanta, which he will be forced to abandon. His men, once confident of victory, now fear every engagement. That's where the week ends. And it's one of victory from the valley to Atlanta. But let's take the time to memorialize and bring due honor to General McPherson. He is the second army commander to die in battle, the first being Nathaniel Lyon all the way back in 1861, loved by both friend and foe alike. My dear young lady, a letter from your mother to General Barry on my staff reminds me that I owe you heartfelt sympathy and the sacred duty of recording the fame what our country's brightest and most glorious characters. I yield to none on earth but yourself the right to excel me in lamentations for our dead hero. Why should death's darts reach the young and brilliant instead of older men who could better have been spared? I will recall the death of my classmate and boyhood friend, General James B. McPherson, the announcement of which caused me sincere sorrow. Sherman, the stubborn stick of the war, cried openly when he heard the news, as does the stone-faced General Grant. He shares Sherman's belief that McPherson could heal the country, and his depression is fully seen in his letter to McPherson's grandmother. Your very welcome letter of the third instant has reached me. I'm glad to know that the relatives of the lamented Major General McPherson are aware of the more than friendship existing between him and myself. The nation grieves at the loss of one so dear to our nation's cause. It is a selfish grief because the nation has more to expect from him than from almost anyone living. I join in this selfish grief and add the grief of personal love for the departed. He formed for some time one of my military family. I knew him well. To know him was to love. Maybe some consolation, and maybe some consolation to you, his aged grandmother, to know that every officer and every soldier who served under your grandson felt the highest reverence for his patriotism, his zeal, his great, almost unequaled ability, his amiability, and all the manly virtues that can adorn a commander. Your bereavement is great. But cannot ex your bereavement is great, but cannot exceed mine. During this time of constant death and maiming, both sides agree to a momentary truce, so all may have a proper burial.
He was a mere 35 years old, waiting till after the war to finally marry his sweetheart. She would die quiet and alone. No one could replace him. Well, it's the first of a week by week team here, and this is my third take on my birthday because I am an idiot when it comes to audio, and I would just like to thank everyone for being with me. I just realized how long I've actually been at this for, and it's amazing. It's amazing that so many of you guys have spent too much time washing what a loser does in his basement. So thank you, and I really do hope to see you next week.